If you've been listening to the Business of Biotech podcast for a while now, you'll recall that Aaron Harris has joined me to co-host a few episodes. Aaron's my friend, colleague, and chief editor over at CellandGene.com, and she just recently launched a podcast of her own. It's aptly named Cell and Gene, the podcast. And if you're working in the Cell and Gene space, you should give it a listen. It's a collection of interviews with the industry and academic leaders moving the space forward. And you can find it at CellandGene.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Cell and Gene, the podcast. Check it out. Welcome back to the Business of Biotech. I'm Matt Piller, and we have a couple of great guests lined up today for a conversation on the democratization of biologic therapies. Lumen Biosciences was founded on the premise that access to biologic therapies can and should be democratized. It's a tall order, but here to share its strategy are the company's founder, Brian Finro, JD, and its EVP of production and development, Dr. Craig Benke. Did I get your name pronounced right there, Craig Benke? Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Got that? All right, cool. Brian and Craig, uh, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have Thank you. Yeah, glad to be on. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. And I want to I want to get to know you guys a little bit better. Uh Brian, I want to start with you. So as I mentioned, you're a, you're a JD, Harvard Law guy. Uh, Harvard right, Law, yeah. Yeah, by way of a degree in poli-sci at Harding. So, you know, I see that poli-sci, law degree. Obviously, you can take that a lot of different places. Uh, but why why and how biotech? Well, yeah, obviously, uh, uh, of course, my uh, scientific training and uh, that poli-sci degree <laughs> from college is very handy uh, here. <laughs> But <laughs> no, it's uh, uh, an indirect route for sure. Uh, I came out of Harvard Law. I uh, grew up here in the Seattle area and moved back uh, very year to get back to the climate. And I have family here. And uh, I took a job at a law firm. Uh, it actually hopscotched around a couple of different, uh, different law firms, the same group of lawyers, the same practice, and the same client, actually, but just working under a different banner. Uh, most recently at the leading biotech law firm, Cooley Goddard. So there, uh, I was doing that for 10 years, and the bulk of my clients were in biotechnology. And the, the sort of work I was doing, I was um, focused on a kind of a distilled essence, if you, if you will, of, uh, of a biotech company. Um, you know, so a lot of uh, venture financing deals, a lot of M&A, and particularly later in my career, a lot of complex licensing and collaboration work. So in each of those types of transactions, you see an incredible amount of scrutiny on the data, on the intellectual property, on the contractual arrangements of the organization. And all of those things together are, if you think about it, in abstract form, what a company is. Yeah. Uh, and so that was an incredible uh, training. Um, practicing law, uh, I really enjoyed as a junior associate being, a, you know, once I started managing my own book of business and uh, looking toward partnership, that I did not find as fun. Um, a lot of committee work and <laughs> marketing and things like that. Wow. Uh, and I was just looking for a little more juice uh, in life than uh, than the gray life of, uh, of of what a law firm offers, uh, and so I went in house from there. That's cool. That's cool. It's a good it's a good story. And you know, you're not but you're not the first uh, JD who uh, JD turned biotech founder that I've talked to. Um, and, and while I've had this conversation before about the aspects of you know having a high law degree that prepare you for this position. Um, Clearly, there are aspects of the position that it doesn't prepare you for. So I'm curious, Brian, what what uh, you know what what would you say you you were admittedly perhaps not prepared for when you took on uh, the, the the creation of Lumen? Oh, well, there's a lot of science, but very little political science in what we do. <laughs> so. I was going to ask you too: is political science? I mean, is there a is there a political political science? Is kind of it, it kind of makes me laugh. Is there a political arts degree? Because I think it, that it, that name <laughs> might be more apropos. <laughs> yeah, everybody's trying to borrow virtue from the the accomplishments of the scientists in our society. <laughs> that's true, including the political scientists. Indeed. Uh, yeah, no, the science the science is uh, that's that's where I put the most effort into. It's uh, it's sipping from a fire hose, I and mean, when you don't have the training and the fundamentals, it's even harder. Um, so for me, that's uh, that's that's the biggest one. There's a million other things, of course, uh, that come up when you try to go from being a an interested observer, I guess I would call myself, uh, being uh, back there at the law firm and professional services um, to doing it yourself. Well, you know, a lot of things look different from the inside. Yeah. Uh, more interesting to my point of view. Uh, and so I, I find that very interesting, and engaging and, uh, and fun in a way most of the time. 
Um, but it's definitely, definitely a learning curve to, to all of these things. Well, sure. Yeah, I, I can. That that totally resonates with me. Um, I, you know, I don't even I don't even come in, into it with a high high law degree. Uh, yeah, but I'm relatively new to the the life sciences space. I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that. I have a high <laughs> law degree. <laughs> as as, uh, as our audience knows, and I've been drinking from the fire hoses as well. But this is why we hire guys like Craig. So so Craig, I want to flip it over to you real quick. You're uh, you know you're the science guy, although your background shows some uh, some diversity as well. You know, I see you were in, the, was it the energy sector for a while? Uh, for, first, first bio, then energy, and you, now you've come back to bio. Tell us a little bit about that trajectory. Well, the, the energy, the, the biofuel stuff I did was biotech in nature. So I've, I've, uh, I've always been interested in science. And then I, I always wanted to, to find a job that would let me do something that, that helped people a little bit or made, a, made something useful. I come from an agricultural uh, farming background, uh, family farmed uh, southwestern Kansas. Um, I always was interested in agriculture. And then I got really interested in lab science. So I've always sought ways to, to do laboratory science that would help help people a lot. Uh, I, I found my way up to Seattle back in the 90s uh, to go to grad school here at University of Washington. Um, did, did my work in, in biochemistry here and then wandered off into invest or into uh, into pharmaceutical biotechnology for uh, small startups for a few years. Worked my way through pharma and then uh, got interested in the, the climate change issues. Uh, and decided to go work for biofuels for a few years. And, and of course, that was deeply interesting science. Commercially, of course, that area has had a lot of challenges, particularly with, with the development of, of things like fracking. Um, but I, I learned an immense amount there about, uh, about how to grow these photosynthetic microorganisms. And uh, about 2018, Brian, who I had gotten to know, called me up and, and basically said, look, you know how to grow my photosynthetic microbes and you know how to do drug discovery work. Why don't you come to the only place in the world that's doing them both at the same time? Uh, so I did. It was an <laughs> offer I couldn't refuse. Yeah, little did Craig know it was, it was it was an offer we had no backup plan for because I mean if you imagine the world in a as a Venn diagram, you know, as a Venn diagram of people that have done pharmaceutical development, and then you've got a Venn diagram of people that have grown massive scale you know, uh, photosynthetic organisms. And there's only one person in the little sliver <laughs> overlapping and the, his name is Craig Benke. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure at all, Craig. No, well, I, and, and it was interesting, the, the science environment here when I got here, Brian kind of played down his uh, scientific uh, level of development. When the, the first day that I was here, he was taking me through the mathematics behind design of experiment and box banking and experimental design and uh, factorial experimental design, whatnot, and asking me questions I didn't know the answer to about how these statistics actually work. I'm like, let me go grab a book. <laughs> yeah, so wow. he's actually quite, uh, when he immerses himself in the scientific area, he you very you you have to keep up. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that, you know, I mean, g given his academic chops, it's not, uh, they, they don't, they don't let just anyone into Harvard law school. So <laughs> there, there's no doubt. Well, I want to, you know, it's, it's uh, you guys are a great mix for this conversation, uh, obviously because you've founded the company on this premise that you could somehow, some way make change that democratizes um, biologic medicine, which again, I mean, it's a, that's a bold thing to endeavor to do. Um but beyond that, right, you've, we've got the sort of the business leadership aspect uh, covered and the, and the science aspect. So I want to get into the weeds. And I wasn't sure, you know, just what the best approach to get into this conversation was, whether it was sort of a, you know, take a linear kind of chronological approach or, you know, start with the business, start and then and then move into the science. Um, so I'm just going to, I don't know, have a go at it. I want to I want to start with the acknowledgement, right, that it is incredibly expensive to develop, much less produce, manufacture, and distribute biologic therapies. Um, and that resulting cost is probably the most high profile reason why democratization of biologic therapies is a difficult nut to crack. I don't know. You could argue it several different ways, and we will as, as we discuss this. But I want to I kind of try to tackle what the problem looks like uh, from a few different perspectives and how Lumen is, is addressing it from each of those perspectives, right? Like, and in, in doing so, I'm hoping that some of that science, Craig, 
uh, that you'll be able to, uh, along the way, share with us what that science is and what Lumen's working on, right? Th those two things should dovetail, I think. Absolutely, they do, yeah. I just, use, I just use a lot of words, and maybe some of those words will save me. They, they go together the, well. The structure of this uh, approach comes crumbling down upon us all. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I figured, though, let's let's start with with supply. Um, let's start talking about like, uh, you know, on the, on the early, you know, kind of development side, um, you know, we talked about plants, uh, let, let's talk about the supply that uh, across the board supply, right? Whether it's, uh, um, raw materials, APIs, uh, uh, you know, single use technologies, consumables, what do you want to talk about on the supply side? Um, how, what, what levers and dials does Lumen have? from that very get-go to affect positive uh, change uh, or affect the, the, the attempt to democratize what you're building. Absolutely. You want, do you want me to take this one? Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, fundamentally the, the, the levers that we are pulling to enable us to make a drug cheaply is based on the fact that we're trying to, to perturb nature as little as possible. When, when you think about how do, how do you make an antibody, okay, in, in today's world, how do you make an injectable antibody therapeutic? Well, you start with a cell that's been excised out of a mouse's ovary, and you're trying to figure out how to make the cell that, that its natural state is to grow in a mouse's ovary, grow in suspension in a giant tank in a completely sterile environment, uh, with an with inputs of of all these you know in, incredibly high osmotic pressure sugars, everything else, that's a tough nut to crack. You you've got to engineer this system very very heavily to successfully grow a, a CHO cell to be able to pump out antibodies. And obviously, the biologics industry has proven that humans can do that very very well, uh, but they can't necessarily do it very very cheaply. There are alkaline lakes uh, in various places around the world where spirulina just grows naturally. There, there's videos on YouTube of people scooting around in motorboats, scooping up the water from a naturally occurring lake that is a higher density of spirulina per liter than most of the stuff that is grown in outdoor photosynthetic ponds. Um, it's just, frankly, not that hard to grow spirulina in the natural world. Now we're bringing it inside, we're bringing it into a clean environment. So we, we do engineer a little bit, but it's still fundamentally not that hard. So getting the chassis to grow is straightforward. The, the challenge has always been getting spirulina to make a useful useful molecule, make it make a binding protein of some sort, make it make something that's like an antibody. And, that, and that's the foundational part of, of Lumen's technology, but it's not that different from just growing spirulina um, outside which is is grown for food purposes at tens of thousands of tons per year yeah it's interesting you know for whatever reason when you talk so you you have an agriculture background this may resonate when you talk about spirulina and the fact that it's readily available in the natural world uh it's it's not you know it, it's not challenged to grow um makes me think about uh mushrooms particularly wild mushrooms that for years so this is going to lead to a question for you a roundabout way to to get to the question, but for years and years and years, um, people, independent farmers in particular, have attempted to mimic the wild and farm uh, things like um, morel mushrooms to very limited success. Right? Like we don't see, you know, midnight mushrooms isn't isn't putting out, uh, you know, bulk quantities of of of, of those delicious delectable wild mushrooms. Uh, are, are there challenges? So it, this, this leads to the question, are there challenges to taking that readily available natural resource and reproducing it in a controlled environment? There, there absolutely are. Uh, obviously you, you have to, you know, you, you're, you're making growth media, you're providing light. So we grow indoors. So we have to provide the light and whatnot. Uh, but to, to turn your question around a little bit, um, if you have to grow a chanterelle, you've got to work really, really, really hard. Uh, what we did is rather than choose that there are exotic algae that can make proteins. People have been engineering uh, different types of algae since the early nineties. Uh, that's all very possible. 
but growing those at scale is really, really challenging. It's the equivalent of, of growing uh, your chanterelles. What we've chosen instead is to figure out how to make something really useful out of button mushrooms. So spirulina is the, the button mushroom, if you will, of the mushroom <laughs> world. You know, it, it's, it's not as fancy. It's not as capable of some of the oddball metabolic tricks that, that some of the other algae out there can do. But the thing it does well is it grows. It grows fast and it grows consistently. So that, that's really what we're doing is rather than try to finally finesse a really hard bug, we're working with one of the easier bugs because there's, there's so many challenges. Everyone listening knows you, there's so many challenges around making a biologic. We didn't need to also bite off the challenge of a really hard strain to grow. Sure. Okay. And thank you, by the way, for indulging my uh, fungi. That's a great analogy. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I mean, it's got, it's got uh, just to pile on here a little bit, hopefully not redundant too much, but uh, I really like this analogy. You know, there's, there's, there's two ways to improve a thing. The one is you can just work at the same thing and, and make it better. Um, then there's the, the, that's what a lot of people are working on. There's a whole CDMO industry that is dedicated to the proposition that it's worthwhile to figure out how to more efficiently grow hamster ovaries mm-hmm. without a hamster wrapped around it. Right. With the stainless steel tanks and the sterile, this and that, and all the exotic growth factors and things. Um, so that's one way to do it. Take that thing, make it better, better, better. And that's a way you can absolutely make progress. Uh, intro manufacturing is about 40 times more productive today than it was when they really first started getting going 30, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I guess. Um, but the other, there's another way to do it, which um, is harder in some ways, but um, it has, gives you a lot of bang for the buck. One, the other way to do it is to select for the thing you want. And what we, were, what we wanted to do was select for simplicity. Um, and here we have the advantage that spirulina, people have been growing this microbe for a long, long time in the U.S., growing massive scale, hundreds of you know, thousands of tons a year in the U.S. and China and India. Uh, it's been on the market forever. So people have already actually put a lot of work into figuring out how to cultivate it, okay. un- unlike Chinese hamster you know, ovary cells when they started working on it. Uh, so we selected for it. The advantage to doing that is that rather than these you know, kind of incremental changes, uh, in- incremental improvements over time, you can reset your baseline to a different level. So selecting for that simplicity is just a starting point for us. And we fully anticipate to get the same kind of over time, you know, 40X improvement in productivity. We're starting from a different baseline. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of an unfair comparison, honestly. Um, There are things that uh, we can do with our platform that you could never do with Cho, obviously. But uh, there are many things that Cho does quite well that you would never, never, ever do with with, with spirulina, with our manufacturing Mm -hmm. host. Um, so the, 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 it's not like one is better than the other in some absolute sense. It's just picking the right tool for the job. Uh, and we just happen to believe here that there are well, there's a wide range of diseases um, that Cho has not partic- proven particularly good at solving. And uh, it's our, uh, you know, really the, the thesis of the entire company here is that maybe with this new tool, uh, some or many of those might be readily solvable uh, coming at it with a different approach. Yeah, understood. So um, would that be a good segue? I'll, I'll leave it up to you to talk uh, just a little bit about what's, what some of those indications might be that you're, you've are you got your eye on, or would you prefer to uh, move toward uh, developmental challenges and, and, and I guess, opportunities for democratization of, of, of your effort? I think I mean, it might make sense to talk about the, the, the development process um, okay. uh, before sort of stepping into the programmatic details. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, so there's, an, you know, can continue on our, our theme here of, uh, you know, selection versus improvement, uh, you know, uh, and, and also, you know, working with the grain of the word, you know, finding an easier task. Yeah. Um, the development side is incredibly important for new drug development. Of course, you know, almost no drug is it for almost no drug, maybe, maybe car could be an exception here, but the, the, the bulk of most new drugs the cost isn't in the manufacturing, even for very expensive manufacturing systems, the, almost all of the cost is in the development of the drug. Mm-hmm. The development costs are paramount in our industry. And then um, and you break that down further, uh, it comes out in a couple of, uh, couple of forms, but um, I think it's generally widely acknowledged that uh, most of the cost is, it comes in the form of failed clinical trials. When you gotta pay famously for the whatever, depends on your math, but uh, in whose numbers you believe, but uh, maybe the 15 or, to 20 failed drug trials out of the one winner 
to be rational about it. In other words, you got to start 20 trials in order to get a drug. And so you got to lump together all of those things. So fail, clinical trial failure is critically important. Um, biologics, in addition, uh, tend to be very expensive uh, to develop through the preclinical stages, much more expensive than small molecules, actually. Mm -hmm. to get them into the clinic. And that's because of the cumbersomeness of CHO manufacturing largely. It's just, it takes a couple of years and about $10 million or even a very efficient modern CDMO to take a, a new protein molecule through uh, all of the process development things. So there's uh, real advantages to working with the grain of the wood um, here as well. Just like what Craig was describing, we want to find a, a, an easy way to do things uh, in the manufacturing side so we can realize those cost efficiencies and make things really scalable. Exactly the same thing is true in all, all across all of our clinical programs. Um, to begin with, the same on the development side, the same simplicity and the same efficiencies that give us low unit costs mm -hmm. also give us faster, cheaper development, cell line establishment, engineering process, validation, all of these things are much easier in a simple system than a cumbersome convoluted system with a whole bunch of different exotic inputs. So that's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask you to um, unpack that a little bit for me, how that sort of simplicity parlays into development. What is it um, specifically that makes it that makes it easier? Uh, well, if you think about what goes on with um, show manufacturing, you know, the engineering of the cell starts with that. But just like what we have to do, uh, if you're working with the CHO, so you have to insert the gene, the DNA somehow into the cell so that it will make the protein you want, usually an antibody, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's uh, very simple in a prokaryotic host like spirulina is basically, you can think of it as being like simple as E. coli with a bunch of photosynthesis protein in it. Mm -hmm. um, so that is much faster and cheaper in our system. The reagents to do that are simpler. The, the process is faster. The, the um, you know, uh, isolating the cell line so that it's truly monoclonal uh, in a way that meets regulatory requirements. Uh, for safety and uh, you know reliability over time uh, is much cheaper and faster. Then when we go into manufacturing, you know the, that's that's where things really start to accelerate in the in the divergence because with Cho uh, you think about all of the crazy reagents and things that go in the process engineering that goes into that sterile fermentation, all the work that goes into even with single use bags, you know cleaning things and turning them around, um, the volumes that can be produced out of a single batch. Uh, and above all, the cost and complexity of all of those, in, those ingredients that go in there, uh, yeah. all of the, 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 the things Craig was describing, the, um, the exotic inputs, uh, oh, those aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. Now, compare that with what we're doing, right? It's non, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be sterile for all of our programs. They're orally delivered. Um, so the, the cleaning requirements or the, you know, exclude a lot of that sterilization it also means that our infrastructure is a lot cheaper rather than all that gleaming stainless steel. We've mm -hmm. got, um, you know, very simple infrastructure is very cheap to buy. It's also being, you know, uh, uh, important on this other performance characteristic called uh, uptime or, um, you know, CapEx utilization. Uh, so rather than being pulsed through in batches, we can grow things in a truly continuous fashion. That means that rather than using that same factory capacity, only 30% of the time, we're using it maybe 90, 95, 98% of the time. Um, and in the media, rather than exotic inputs, it's simply, it's city water. We like literally open a tap to get from the city. Uh, and then we have about a dozen salts that go into it that we procure in big sacks. Uh, so it's just based always actually just essentially the same things you put on your tomatoes. Photosynthesis, the prokaryotic cyanobacterium means that it, it makes everything it needs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then downstream, equally simple. You know, if you're working with Cho, you got to purify things out and you got to do a lot of safety testing. There's a lot of ways to make the disease worse if you get um, contaminants in an in injected protein therapeutic. That's because pro injecting proteins at high volume into your blood system is inherently an unsafe thing. Mm -hmm. That's the default setting. It's unsafe. You got to go extreme lengths to purify things, check things, test things over and over again to make sure that it's you're not going to actually hurt somebody trying to make them better. Now, what we're doing, we're orally delivering in all of our current pipeline programs, proteins. Now, eating proteins is an inherently safe thing. That's what you do every day. Every plant, every you know steak you eat, everything uh, is full of proteins, all kinds of strange proteins. And by the way, they're also covered with all kinds of crazy bacteria. Those are making their own proteins. And the bacteria inside your GI tract, they're making crazy proteins. Those bacteria themselves are being attacked constantly by bacteriophages. They're making still more proteins. There's all kinds of crazy proteins in your GI tract, and it's, it's by default safe. 
So what we're doing is kind of working with the grain of the wood. And that means the downstream, rather than all of that extra caution they have to engineer into the system to make it safe, is uh, sort of in, inherently safe in from a, the, the sort of this default setting is inherently safe for what we're doing. And that means that the downstream process for us simply boils down to uh, almost a single step spray drying. You just eat the whole cell and put the antibodies inside of it and everything, the whole gamish. And uh, the cost efficiencies on that one step alone uh, are tremendous. Right. The business of biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. What are the limitations? I mean, certainly there have to be limitations. If it was this easy to do, you know, to, 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 to just do biologics, if it was this cheap and easy, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I mean, the big, big obvious one is uh, you don't want to be injecting gamish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Injectable gamish is not a thing. I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, you want to go, you know, do all of the purification and everything else. So we're targeting uh, uh, tissues, uh, diseases that have receptors or targets in tissues of the body that can be uh, addressed directly with the prepared protein where the tissue barrier function is still intact. So the GI tract is the easiest one. Yeah. Uh, but but also the upper respiratory tract and uh, and the skin, for example, uh, have all these same attributes. That's the main limitation. So. Main limitation, but uh, where there's where some, as is often the case in life, where there are certain limitations, there are also other great big opportunities. And that uh, you know that microbiome opportunity is one that has got a lot of attention right now. Um, and when you marry that with with antibodies and, and proteins and, and biologic therapeutics, I think. Uh, there's probably quite a bit of opportunity to yet to be explored there. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to put it. Um, there's a nice complementarity uh, to what we do relative to what uh, traditional biologics manufacturing does. If you think about it, what they do, they fill up your vasculature with huge amounts of antibody. You know, the top dose in the Regeneron uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 trial was eight grams of pure antibody, which is really a colossal amount of antibody. That's $1,600 or so at traditional manufacturing costs. Um, that's the dose that Donald Trump got. And, uh, you know, it works. I mean, definitely works. But, you know, the challenge is that the amount of that antibody, the concentrations and concentration, of course, drives much of the drugs effects in, you know, in the, in the real world setting is about a thousand fold lower, maybe even lower than that uh, outside of the blood serum. So it's got the, those antibodies are very large molecules. They have a hard time squeezing out of the vasculature into the interstitial tissues and need an even harder time than that getting to where the disease like SARS-CoV-2 or C. difficile infection or norovirus, to name some of our other programs, mm -hmm. uh, where those pathogens actually attack you, which is up in the mucosal tissue or the GI lumen itself. And so consequently, you see very, very few programs in traditional biologics drug development directed at infectious diseases for this very simple reason. That's where most of those infectious disease targets attack you, uh, pathogens attack you, uh, but that's the, it's the hardest place for the antibody to get to. Yeah. So, so if you can think of them as kind of coming from the bottom up, uh, from the blood serum up through the you know, sort of foundation and flooring to get into the, the site of disease, uh, for these diseases, we're coming from the top down. And there just turns out to be um, a tremendous amounts of unmet medical need in all of these areas that are uh, just kind of being left behind by traditional drug development technologies. Mm -hmm. Craig, uh, you, you've been you've been um, given the floor to, to Brian here. Did you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there there's technical limitations on our our system. It's a it's a prokaryote, so it doesn't glycosylate proteins. Um, it's got a couple of other features that that you know it, it. We need to simplify things a little bit in the sort of things that we go after. The other the other th reason that infectious diseases are are typically a, a challenging um, area for injective biologics to go after 
is that you you often have to have a chronic administration, um, or particularly if you're going, if, if you were to apply, yeah, you can eat an antibody. Uh, people have done this, immunize cattle, um, harvest the colostrum, and that's an antibody product, and you eat it. Um, and that works. That that's fine. But you got to you you have to keep eating it over and over again because your body, of course, washes everything out that, that goes in the digestive tract. So one of the features that makes that sort of an application route for traditional biologic heart is is not you know it's not just that it's a, a couple hundred bucks a gram for the antibody that you have to take today. It's a couple hundred bucks tomorrow and a couple hundred bucks the day after that and the day after that. And before you know it, you're talking a hundred thousand dollar course of treatment to prevent a non-lethal uh, in many cases or, or a, a lethal for a few people disease state and people just won't do that. But if you can knock the price of manufacturing down to where it's a buck a day or a couple bucks a day or something like that, now all of a sudden you've got, uh, it, it's feasible. Uh, you know, it's it's not only entering the realm where people can afford it, uh, it it's where, where people in, in the, the wealthy world can afford it. You're starting to enter the realm where people, you know, organizations that provide medicines to the to the developing world can also start to access these things and get them to their patient populations that that desperately need some of these things. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the that's one of the uh, I guess other aspects or facets of uh, your company that's fascinating to me. Uh, toward the end of, 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 of or, or to the, speaking to the goal of democratizing biologics is that um, alternative, I guess, administration approach, right? Like when you explore areas beyond or opportunities or, or um, uh, avenues of administration beyond parenteral, um, mm -hmm. that inherently democratizes uh, biologics via patient, you know, the patient experience. Am I, am I right? Is that sort of part of the part of the approach? Absolutely. Uh, one of the, the things that we sold on early on with our with our spray drying of, of stuff and the, the characterization, we, we had hoped it would be the case and it turned out to be the case that when spray dried, these powders of spirulina are, are stable and the antibodies inside them are stable for months, years on end at room temperature. Uh, you know, they're, they're humidity susceptible, so you have to keep them properly packaged, but that's true of, of most powdered type type medications. But as long as they're they're in a pill and a blister pack, uh, there's absolutely no reason you can't throw them on the back of a truck and drive them around in some place where it's 40 degrees centigrade for weeks on end, and the drugs will be just fine. So if you are uh, 200 kilometers from a minus 80 freezer today, you can't be treated with a medication that has to be stored and administered uh, straight out of a minus 80 freezer. It's, it's just not possible. And there's an awful big part of the world with a whole lot of important people in it that live 200 kilometers plus from the nearest minus 80 freezer. So you got you, you have to figure out a way to uh, bring the therapeutic to the people who need it. And these things, you know, we, we store these things at room temperature. Um, I've got a bottle sitting in my desk for the last two years. It hasn't lost any of its antibody. That that particular one is is directed against Campylobacter. That's not an official stability sample, by the way, but that's just just my uh, my example. Um, it's perfectly fine after two years sitting at room temperature. Um, yeah, it's it's an it's an incredibly important point. I can give you a, a concrete example. I think probably everybody's aware of. Uh, you know, these uh, antibody cocktails directed at COVID-19, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that they work. I mean, you got to administer them early, you know, mixed results, late stage, but uh, there's no doubt they work. You know, Donald Trump got a good thing, uh, uh, but, you know, they're, they're uh, very expensive to manufacture. Um, like I say, it's a very large dose, even if you're not getting the Cadillac dose that uh, Trump got, <laughs> they're, still, they're still very expensive. That means, as Craig alluded to, it's immediately off the table for most of the world. Yeah. But even in the United States, you know, the amazing thing is there is actually, I think, plenty of supply from what I've read in the papers of these antibodies. But the main problem is that there's these additional speed bumps. Uh, first of all, you got to get hit by a needle. That's like 10% of the population. It's, it's, no, it's no fair to just make fun of that. Needle fear is a real thing. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a real problem, a real barrier to access if you think about it the way you, we do. But secondly, it's just the sheer, uh, uh, the, the trouble of, uh, it should be a simple thing, right? You got to go to an IV infusion clinic and get the thing administered. Uh, and that uh, proves in the, again, in the context of something like a pandemic, but even, um, even less acutely, uh, it is another barrier to adoption. Uh, and that, I, from what I understand, is a, a major uh, reason why they're, they're not being more widely used, even though it's very clear that, again, administered early, particularly to at-risk populations, is, is something you want to have. Um, so oral delivery, particularly coupled with shelf stability, like Craig described, is incredibly important, completely independently of cost or uh, scalability, is, an, is, a, is a noble goal in its own right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to the end of of democratization. Um, I, I do want to talk about scalability because I want to I want to talk a little bit about your sh shifting gears a bit. I want to talk about your uh, production approach and facility. So I understand you guys have uh, you you've built or or, or yeah established anyway a a, a, a GMP CMG, CGMP that is a production facility. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What, what went into the decision to to do that, to not, you know, that's <laughs> the, the decision to do that was very simple in that there are no CDMOs that can grow spirulina photosynthetically. Uh, it, it doesn't exist. So uh, if you want to do it, you got to build it yourself. You and, also remember what I said earlier about the Venn diagrams. Craig's the only guy. So there's, there's no, <laughs> we got, um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we, we have put together and operate a, a very small pilot plant um, by, by the, standards of, of spirulina production, very small pilot plant here in Seattle, uh, where we're able to, to put together manufacture and spray dry package um, materials for, for clinical trials. We will develop larger scale facilities in the future that um, you, know, you, you gotta get through your clinical trials uh, before you can convince people to invest in the real thing. But the real thing will be dramatically cheaper than, uh, than, than what you might think of as a, a pharmaceutical plant. The best thing that I would say about scale, if you think about the, the global spirulina production is somewhere in the ballpark of 30,000, 50,000 tons a year. Uh, nobody really knows because it's made all over the world and it's made them large facilities and, and small facilities. Um, but let's say it's, it's 50,000 tons a year. Um, that would mean that uh, if if you're five percent of the biomass, um, which our antibodies are somewhere in the ballpark of five percent of the biomass, uh, you're talking about 250 tons a year. Did I do that math right? Of pure antibody. Uh, that, that'd be a fine question for the, um, the scientists. 100 tons a year, I think. Um, yeah, that, that's a couple of orders of magnitude larger than the totality of humanity's ability to make monoclonal antibodies today. So if you just used the existing infrastructure of making spirulina, you could, you could make a hundred times more antibody than the world can make. So it's intrinsically scalable. Um, a, a modest sized facility in the United States can produce anywhere from 500 to a thousand tons a year of, of spirulina. Uh, you know, it, it quite, quite large amounts of material. So it, it scales really easily um, because all you're talking about is is basically hydroponics um, for all intents and purposes. It's not, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't require um, the sort of sterile processing that a, uh, a standard um, cell culture requires. The, the spirulina actually can grow. They're, they're not an azenic organism. Um, they, but they, they're an extremophile. So they grow in an environment where other things don't take over, where, where they grow stably, securely, uh, and, and that's, that's the only thing that, that grows. What, uh, what, what needs to happen, uh, I guess, what, what, what big hurdles remain or challenges need to be addressed to be able to take that vast opportunity um, and, and turn it into clinical grade supply to, to I, clinical trials. I'll jump in here a little bit because Craig's understating his own contributions like a good Midwesterner. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's a pretty mature system at this point. Um, we're today manufacturing out of the current GMP plant. Uh, it's about three kilograms per week of drug okay. substance. 
uh, which is remarkable in the sense, I mean, we're a small company. Um, that, that plant's been operating for four years now. So it's, it's a pretty mature process already. Uh, but we're a very small company. You know, we, we're 75 people. We've had uh, two VC financing rounds, very small by modern standards. Uh, and it's uh, that alone is a measure of the efficiency of our of our system. This is this is completely implausible if we were working with a complicated thing like like Cho. Uh, now we since have uh, signed a lease on some an additional fifteen thousand square feet of space. Um, just uh, we'll be moving that operation. That'll give us uh, allow us to increase our production capacity to about uh, uh, twelve or fifteen kilograms a week drug substance. Again, very light footprint, very inexpensive infrastructure compared with what's, what's traditional. Getting that to full scale, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to take more investment, obviously. Um, all of the diseases on our current pipeline uh, have, have a feature in common. Well, a couple of features in common. Like I say, well, number one, they wouldn't be on our pipeline if they were uh, not unmet medical needs. These are things that, again, have been essentially abandoned by users of the traditional drug making tools. Uh, so that's one thing every single one of them has in common. But another thing they have in common is their extraordinarily prevalence. Um, you know, our industry is it's just kind of a, a funny thing. You know, as, as the industry matured and uh, these with these tools, they plucked the low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit, the juiciest low-hanging fruit, of course, in these terms, uh, is is the biggest markets, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so uh, lots of people have written about this. So over time, you've seen the rise of things like, you know, the orphan drug business model, specialty pharma, now even more and more uh, ultra orphan indications. The smaller the market, the better, um, because it makes trials more tractable and gives you much more pricing power with, with the pairs. And so we've kind of gotten away from our original roots as an industry. Uh, in a way, we're returning to the, to the heyday. The most profitable era in the biopharmaceutical industry is actually when they were treating these horrifically prevalent diseases, um, the things we've almost forgotten about today, like um, you know bacterial infections. Uh, those were the miracle drugs of the 20th century. Um, they plucked all that low hanging fruit with uh, small molecule drugs long ago, right? And that's, uh, you know, these things are all generic now. Um, the, the biologics industry did the same with uh, autoimmune dis disorders in the 90s and early 2000s. So you get think blockbusters like Umira, very prevalent, very widespread. Um, we've got a new tool that allows us to go after new diseases, things that have been left behind by those old tools. And uh, unsurprisingly, we're going after the ones that have the highest prevalence. So, so, so just massive, massive prevalence uh, in the markets today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After those where the manufacturing system can, that can scale to meet that demand. And that's really how we think about, it. of course, you know, we get economies of scale with scale, but really the question is if this stuff works half as well as we expect it to, uh, we're going to need just massive volumes. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's, a, that's a problem for a, you know, a year or two from now <laughs> that Craig will be grappling with and have him back on the show and ask him how it's going. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, we'll definitely do that. Um, what, what needs to happen? I, I guess when you say massive volumes, I'm curious, and I know it might be early. So some of this might just kind of be conjecture or prognostication, but what, uh, what does clinical supply look like for you? Well, so I, was, I say one thing, I think probably relevant to talk about how photosynthetic systems are scaled, but I, will, I, would, I would like to point out that by most people's standards, 15 kilograms a week manufacturing capacity for drug substance is massive supply. That's so yeah. right. I, feel yeah. like, I feel like, you know, we're feeling pretty good about ourselves yeah. at 15 kilos a week, yeah. uh, but no, we need billions of doses. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is all together another matter of scale, but Craig, you can probably talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a, a million small details. Uh, <laughs> we don't, don't need to go in, into huge details, but you know, we're, we're talking uh, a few hundred tons a year to treat some of these diseases um, because we're not talking about patient populations of, of 5,000 or 10,000 people. We're, we're talking, what, what's the, how many people have C. diff worldwide every year? It's about 500,000 cases a year just in the U S Yeah, and, and we need, you know, a, a bunch of pills for each one of those, yeah. those cases. It really adds up fast. Uh, so the, the manufacturing capability, it's, it's really, you know, it, population as a whole takes a very dim view if you bring out a wonderful new drug and then say, well, only 10% of you actually get it because we can't make enough. Um, right. uh, you know, people get very cranky about that. So we, we, you know, we need to plan for being able to supply our patient populations. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, we're running short on time here, guys. I feel like we could, I, I feel like <laughs> we're starting to scratch the surface and I feel like we could talk for quite a while, but um, 
I do want to start wrapping things up here and perhaps we will schedule a part two. Uh, but I, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to kind of give us an update as to uh, where you stand right now and what the next big step is, be that uh, clinical or developmental, uh, you know, what what you sort of see as the next, um, you know, ne- next big step for Lumen to take. Uh, well, I, I can feel that one. Uh, you know, biotechnology companies live and die on the data. So uh, we're no exception. Uh, we have three programs, or two programs in the clinic actively now, uh, and a third about to enter. Uh, and that's, by the way, itself an unbelievable luxury and a mark of the productivity of the system, not so much on the manufacturing side, but going back to the early comments about cost of development and speed of development. Uh, so all three of these trials will be playing out uh, early into mid next year, okay. uh, phase two studies. So those, those three programs are directed, uh, first one out of the gates will be directed at traveler's diarrhea. This is uh, it's a, one that's in the cl- currently in the clinic, Brian? One of them, we've completed the phase one study there, just squeaked it under the wire before the COVID pandemic hit last year. And that'll be going through a, uh, a phase two challenge study at the University of Maryland. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second program, uh, really, you can think of it as being the kind of the obvious commercial opportunity uh, is C. difficile infection. So prevention of recurrence, C. difficile infection is very similar uh, in many respects, not all respects, very similar to the marketed Merck antibody drug called uh, Zimplava or Bezlotoximab. Uh, but again, we're delivering from the top down rather than from the bottom up through the vasculature. Uh, so that program is in phase one now, very small a capsule dissolution study. We'll be wrapping that one up this fall uh, and then moving that into phase two next year. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we have an army funded program. Uh, the DOD funded a program that, that directed at uh, COVID-19. And there it's, uh, it's not what you'd expect. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the surprising to some folks, but not to clinicians, there are uh, in some patients quite severe GI manifestations of COVID-19. Hmm. Uh, there are absolutely no treatments out there because we're the only ones who have a, a platform that is amenable to uh, developing a treatment for that. Uh, subset of the COVID-19 syndrome. So uh, so that program will be going into the clinic as well uh, early next year. Uh, so we'll see, we'll be looking to see data on those three as well. Uh, in addition to those, we have ad- additional programs. The two that uh, we're very excited about, so moving beyond infectious disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, it's another one. If you talk to immunologists, I'll tell you it's a you know, systemic disease, systemic disorder of your immune system, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, but uh, very obviously, there's a nexus to events happening in the GI tract. Uh, and we believe that uh, a product that is GI specific in its, act, in its action using therapeutic proteins that are not absorbed, non systemically circulation, circul- uh, circulating, can accomplish two things. First of all, uh, many of the drugs currently on the market have pretty severe side effects, uh, you know, a lot of you know, tumors and uh, increased risk of infectious disease, et cetera. Uh, so sidestepping those with tissue-specific addressing of the disease and the inflammation uh, should be a good way to, to make some progress. Um, but additionally, you know, so remarkably, um, there are no approved therapies for mild to moderate Crohn's disease today. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's only for severe disease, even though everybody progresses ultimately. Um, and it's, it's partly because of the cost, you know, $20,000 a month. It's not so easy for a lot of families to afford, but it's also because of the side effect profile. So we think that the combination of the safe, the intrinsic safety of the approach, plus the, uh, you know, the democratize, democratizability, <laughs> can, we, can we coin the term, uh, of this approach have tremendous potential. So we aim to get that into the clinic next year as well. Uh, and then finally, we have a new collaboration with our, our partners at Novo Nordisk, uh, in, directed at cardiometabolic disease. And I don't think I have to say uh, not too much further about that, other than to point out that the market for a safe and effective diet drug has got to be maybe the biggest market on the planet today. Completely unmet need. There's just nothing for these folks. Indeed. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that update. And uh, as I said, I mean, I could I could continue asking questions, but <laughs> we, we need to schedule a part two. Um, it's been very insightful, though. And, and I appreciate the, uh, you know, the transparency and the insight you've shared. Uh, Brian, uh, it was a pleasure. And Craig, I love the fact that you're from Kansas and grew up with your hands in the dirt. Um, great, great story. And we'll be paying attention. We'll be keeping. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Matt. Yeah.
So that's Lumen Biosciences, Brian Finro and Craig Benke. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We are produced by Bioprocess Online with partnership from Cytiva, which demonstrates its support for new and emerging biotechs at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Check that out. Check us out at bioprocessonline.com where you can subscribe to my newsletter. And if you like what you heard today, subscribe to the pod. Give us five stars. Thanks for listening.